So, good morning everyone. So today uh, we're going to continue our study of the Schwarzschild geometry. So, in fact, we're going to get at the heart of it. Uh, I'll try to convince you that uh, uh, the Schwarzschild metric represents a black hole geometry. Um, make, try to make clear what it means. Uh, and so, in fact, the right statement will be that um, an extension of the Schwarzschild metric, uh, as we've seen it last time, provides a black hole geometry. So, uh, we started to do some preliminary work about this and uh, concerning uh, causality. One of them uh, was time orientation. So, and time orientation is the decision uh, where, so this is a reminder, right? So, which of these uh, cones of time like vectors, so you have a time like vectors here. And you have time-like vectors here. And which of those are future pointing and past pointing, right? So choice uh, which, what is future, what is past. Future, what is a future directed vector. And a causal vector. Right. So you have two possibilities, and once you've done this choice, you've done it, and this should be a continuous choice, right? So this is the continuous over the manifold. Uh, if something like that exists, we say this is space-time. If there are no such things, then there's no such thing, and we just talk about a Lorentzian manifold, but uh, we can't really do physics there because we believe that there is a preferred direction of time, future, and past in our real world, or at least locally in our, uh, on our Earth. You know, maybe globally there isn't one. Maybe globally uh, there is a problem with the time orientation, but at least uh, the physics we know it in the neighborhood of the Earth uh, has such a preferred time direction. Uh, good, and so uh, this was a reminder, and uh, uh, another reminder goes way back, but uh, uh, still uh, good to know that a curve is, uh, uh, well, time-like, so curve gamma, uh, time-like, causal, null, uh, Space like uh, will also go, but uh, at this stage we only need this if uh, if uh, the length of the tangent is uh, time like smaller than zero, causal is uh, uh, oh, it's strictly smaller for time like. Uh, causal would be smaller equal zero, null would be zero, and uh, usually uh, when talking about curves, one assumes that the uh, that gamma dot never vanishes, right? So we just don't want to talk about stupid curves where you follow the curve for a while and sit at this place for two hours, then continue. Of course, you could do this in space, but in time doesn't work. Time wants to flow all the time, right? So gamma dot never vanishes. Uh, so, so here the zero here uh, doesn't allow a zero vector. And now, and future directed uh, is if uh, uh, gamma dot is, well, it has to be one of those. If gamma is causal, so gamma is causal, is causal, and gamma dot is future pointing. Everywhere, of course. So you don't want a curve which goes uh, a little to the future, goes a little to the past, goes a little to the future, goes a little to the past. That's not good. Good. 
Uh, so these are things which that you know in principle. By the way, uh, I've noticed when viewing uh, the video from my last lecture that sometimes what I write here and which looks perfectly clear to me is not well visible on the black uh, on the screen. So please uh, allow me if the uh, writing isn't uh, clear enough, and then I I will. Uh, try to change markers or try to do something about this. So a new definition. Uh, a function is called a time function So a time function, if it's uh, if its gradient uh, is past pointing, right? So if its gradient is time-like and past pointing, uh, I've lost the cap of the marker. I hate this. Uh, I don't know where I put it. Um, let's see if this marker will work better. Probably not. If uh, grad, so function f, if grad f is time like uh, and past pointing. So this past pointing is, uh, has to do with, uh, uh, with my uh, signature. Uh, somehow one would have the feeling a time function which should have a future pointing gradient, but that's going to be clearer in a minute. Let me also define a coordinate is uh, uh, a time coordinate. A coordinate is a time coordinate if uh, it is a time function. It is a time function. In other words, its gradient is good. So maybe an example. Uh, we take the Minkowski metric. Uh, so the metric is just, um, we usually like to write uh, eta for the metric, then this is minus dt squared plus, uh, let me write it like that. Uh, so, uh, and we take f is equal t. Then the matrix uh, g, uh, g as a matrix is minus 1 and uh, plus ones all over uh, here. Um, so the inverse metric is, of course, uh, the same. If you want to think of this in terms of matrices, but of course, not the same as an object because it's uh, the inverse metric. So what's the uh, gradient of uh, f? So the differential of f is uh, just dt. The gradient of f uh, is defined as g mu nu uh, d mu f times d nu. All right, so you just take the differential, which would be this thing, and you raise the index with the inverse metric. <laughs> it's funny because when I do this, actually, I'm hiding it for myself <laughs> uh, while I should be hiding it for you, but it's just hard to <laughs> do. Uh, uh, yeah, there's, uh, okay. there's room for improvement for this blackboard here. Uh, anyway, uh, so, right, so, so this is the differential, and we've raised the index uh, with... Um, with the metric, 
so of course, in this case, uh, this has uh, the differential of t has only a time coordinate, and we, and we raise the index. That is going to be g zero zero dt, and this is minus dt, right? And so uh, this function f is our usual time in Minkowski space time, but uh, because of my signature, which is silly for the purpose here, but it's very good for every other purpose that I know of, or most our purposes that I know of, because of this minus one in the metric, uh, you pick up this minus one here, and this explains this uh, past pointing here, right? So. Uh, the vector dt is past pointing, uh, so but, but this is still a time function, right? So this is a time function, and um, it increases as as we leave, but uh, but its gradient is past pointing. So um, so what's the story now? What, why are these uh, time functions interesting? Yeah, so uh, so. Uh, Okay, before we go to a theorem, well, I can just announce it already. So, so time functions have the property that they grow, uh, they always increase along time-like curves, and that's what makes them interesting. And we're going to, uh, to make a formal statement about this shortly. Uh, they were introduced by a colleague from this university, namely uh, Gödel, uh, a while back. So uh, you suddenly heard of her Gödel in a different context with his uh, uh, famous incompleteness theorem. Um, well, Gödel was interested in logic and hence in philosophy and hence was interested in general relativity for its philosophical implications and he discovered a beautiful solution of uh, Einstein equations called the Gödel metric, Gödel spacetime, which has very funny uh, causality properties and to study this uh, solution he invented to introduce this notion of time function. Uh, so, uh, good. So, in Minkowski, uh, function f is t is a time function, and, uh, and therefore t is also a time coordinate. And note that minus t is not a time function in this uh, terminology. So, the gradient of minus t is still time-like, uh, because my, if I change the sign of f, I'm going to change the sign here. The vector d over dt is time-like. But, um, but of course, it, it points in the wrong direction. So, so let's look at the uh, Schwarzschild metric. Uh, that's uh, same function t. So uh, for those of you who forgot, the Schwarzschild metric looks like minus v dt squared plus dr squared over v plus r squared d omega squared. This is the metric on the sphere. And this function v was uh, 1 minus 2m over r. Uh, so as a matrix, uh, g would be therefore minus v, 1 over v, uh, and well, r square, r square sine square theta. A lot of zeros. And the inverse metric will therefore be uh, minus 1 over v, v well it's also diagonal, a lot of zeros, uh, v, well whatever, I'm not going to write this down, it's uh, diagonal. And um, so if we take the same function f equal t, then the gradient, so the differential is still 
dt. The gradient is, because the metric is diagonal, if I use uh, my equation 1 here, uh, uh, yeah, the metric is diagonal and df has only a t component, so I'm going to end up with this. Now g0,0 is minus 1 over v, right? Minus 1 over v uh, dt. And if I look at the length of the gradient, uh, okay, so, uh, well, we already have the gradient here, so uh, the metric is bilinear, so I can pull out this factor 1 uh, over v in front, 1 over v square. Um, g of dt dt. This is g0,0. Zero, zero. And g0,0 zero, zero is minus v. So I'm going to get uh, minus 1 over v. Now, one, minus 1 over v, uh, this is well, there is a minus sign first, and there is this 1 over 1 minus 2m over r. And the question is, uh, when, when is this negative? Right? Is this negative? Because that's what we need for time functions. Uh, that's a necessary condition. Then there's also a question of time orientation, which we need to, uh, to worry about shortly. But uh, we certainly need to make sure that this is a this is a uh, time lag vector. So. Uh, well, from here we see that this is going to be negative if v is positive, right? So uh, only if, if and only if v is positive. Um, So uh, uh, the length square of gradient of f is negative if and only if v is positive. That is, if and only <laughs> I'm going to get there. If and only if uh, one minus two m over r is positive. So if I assume that r is positive. And this is the same as r minus 2m larger than 0. I just can multiply by r. And uh, for uh, r larger than 2m. Okay. So, uh, well, time-like. So t is not time-like, right? So grad t is not time-like under the horizon in the region are smaller than 2m. It is time-like, is time-like in the region r larger than 2m. And now the question is, is this a time function or not? Is it future past pointing or not? Well, uh, if we go to this formula, uh, we see that, uh, so this would be equation 3, right? So. Uh, by 3, it is 
uh, past pointing in this region. Uh, because we take the usual time orientation that dt is future pointing because of this minus sign is past pointing, okay? So, in other words, t is a time function in the, uh, in the exterior world, right? The region all out of into m. So, let's still continue with the Schwarzschild metric. So, still, uh, still Schwarzschild. But we take the function r, and f is equal r, and we just repeat this calculation. So grad f is grad r is g mu nu d mu f d nu r, uh, d nu. Now uh, g mu r f is delta mu r. So this is gr nu. It's hard to make a distinction between many mu's, r's, and nu's, but let me make it alpha, beta. Okay? Okay. So that's going to be maybe a little clearer. And it slows down the lecture too, so maybe it's welcome for some of you. So G alpha beta, alpha beta, then this is delta R alpha, so we get uh, R beta D beta. But now the inverse metric, we have it here. It's diagonal, so it's just GRR, uh, DR, and GRR with V. So this is my gradient. Now if I calculate its length, g of grad f, grad r, grad r, well, by bilinearity I get a v squared term, and I get g of dr, dr. This is grr. Do you still see my, yeah, my writing? Sorry, it's a little small, so let me just write it up here, so this is the same as GRR, and GRR is 1 over V, right, 1 over V, so we get uh, that this is 1 over, this is V, right. Now, V is positive in the exterior world, so Grad R is space-like in the exterior world, but V is negative in the, under the horizon, so grad R is time-like under the horizon. So under the horizon, it's something when you first hear it, it's weird that the, um, that the R coordinate is actually a time function, but, uh, well, it is the case, right? I mean, one thinks of R as being a uh, distance from the origin. That's certainly the case in the Euclidean geometry. And so, think, what is this nonsense? Why should R be a time function? But, indeed, so, uh, yeah, grad R is time-like. for r smaller than 2m under the horizon. Now, it's time-like, so uh, maybe it's a time function, maybe not, right? Uh, because there is still the question of orientation. And either r or minus r are time functions. Well, there, of course. Not everywhere. Not in the exterior world. In the exterior world, V is positive, so gradient is space-like. So R is a time coordinate under the horizon. That's the 
conclusion of this calculation here. And, um, and uh, whether it's a time, uh, well, r, either r or minus r. And which one? Uh, this is something that we'll need to decide. Uh, first, it's a question of convention. So when we just have this region r smaller than 2m, in fact, there are two space times. There is one space time where we've decided that, that r is a time function, and another one where we've decided the minus r is time, time function. Right? From the point of view of space time, that's different space times. Same Lorentzian metric, but different space times. And uh, how does this fit with our world? Well, we'll, we'll get there. We'll get there. Right? So maybe you just want to be perplexed for a moment and think, what is this nonsense? But uh, it's going, it should become clearer at the end of today's lecture. Good. So now what is the point of the, uh, of time functions? And this is the following proposition, which I've already mentioned. Uh, time functions are strictly monotonous well, actually strictly increasing it's going to melt <laughs> uh, I have to get rid of the water first because then it becomes disgusting it just seeps down uh, are strictly uh, increasing along future directed Timeline curves along world lines, right? Along world lines. Um, so these are future directed timeline curves. Future directed. Well, in fact, uh, causal curves. Not only timeline, but causal as well. Good. So we're going to prove this right away. Uh, and we see how uh, this fits. Uh, and this is going to be a key fact to understand uh, the geometry of uh, a suitable extension of the Schwarzschild metric that this is black hole. So the, this, this notion of time functions is key to understand what black holes are. And that's why I'm talking about it now. So, uh, so we're going to prove this proposition, but before the proof, we need a lemma. Uh, so we take uh, two vectors. Uh, let x be timelike. and y causal, then the scalar product uh, of x and y is um, positive if uh, x, y oppositely. How do you say oppositely? Is there a, a, an adjective oppositely? I mean, two objects are opposite to each other, so can you be oppositely oriented? Is this correct? Oppositely oriented? Right. I think I'd say opposingly. Yeah. Say it again? Yeah. 
Opposingly. Opposingly. Great. Okay. Opposingly. Wunderbar. Thanks a lot. Opposingly oriented. Uh, time oriented, of course, right? Time oriented. And is negative if they are uh, uh, so uh, <laughs> the inverse of posingly is uh, <laughs> well have the same orientation. How would you say that? Uh, if x i are uh, um, well, whatever <laughs> have the same uh, have the same time orientation, right? So the same being that they both future or both past, and opposingly is one of them is one direction, have the same uh, time orientation. Good, and the proof uh, is uh, very simple. If, uh, <laughs> well, I don't dare asking if anyone from you remembers what the inverse cauchy schwarz inequality is. Uh, we did something like that in uh, General Relativity 1. So it's a, a very, uh, th this statement is a, a very simple version of, of the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality or the inverse Cauchy-Schwarz inequality. But so, so let's see. So in local inertial coordinates, local inertial coordinates at P, uh, uh, so we can arrange uh, uh, x uh, to be uh, to have only one component to take uh, um, maybe I should have said after a boost after boosting local inertial coordinates okay after applying a boost okay that's the right way to say after applying a boost to local inertial coordinate A Lorentz transformations to local inertial coordinates at P. And we can arrange X to, to take the form uh, X is X naught dt. Right? So we go to local inertial coordinates. Uh, the metric is this coordinates is just the Minkowski metric at this point. So everything we know about the Minkowski metric we can use here. In particular, because x is time-like, uh, we can find a coordinate system, a Lorentzian coordinate system, so that x takes this form, so no space components. And of course, uh, this means applying a Lorentz transformation to your coordinates, right? And so applying a Lorentz transformation to the Minkowski metric still leaves you with the Minkowski metric, so you'll still get the local inertial coordinates. Now, x has this form, right? So y is uh, just, uh, well, whatever it is, dt uh, plus uh, yi di. And if I calculate the scalar product of gx and y uh, at p, then this is the same as the Minkowski and scalar product. Uh, at this point is just minus x naught y naught. Now x is time-like, so x naught is non-zero. Y is causal, so y naught is non-zero. So this is non-zero. And uh, well, if they are consistently, I was looking for this word consistently, right? So if x, x and y are consistently oriented, it means that x0 and y0 has the same sign, then this would be negative, right? Same, same time orientation would be negative. And if they are opposing, opposingly, I don't like this opposingly. Well, I don't take any responsibility for opposingly, right? So this is whoever told me to use this, I'm using it. But uh, if they have opposite signs, then the product will be negative, this will be positive, and this is our lemma. Okay, good. So this is a triviality, uh, but it, th this is the kind of things you really should remember, right? So uh, time-like and causal, then uh, 
uh, if they are uh, oriented in this, have the same orientation, you get smaller than zero. Uh, in the causal case, uh, you would get, if both are causal, then you get smaller equals zero here, right? And there is, uh, if for those of you who remember your inverse cauchy schwarz inequality, then uh, the uh, equality is only attained if they are collinear, right? So that, that works here as well. Um, good. In the equality, in the inverse cauchy schwarz inequality. Let's see. So, so, uh, so the lemma is done, and then the proposition. So now we prove the proposition. Uh, I think I have to erase this because I, otherwise I won't have enough room. So much to my regret, let me erase all this. And now we're going to prove the proposition. So time functions are strictly increasing along future directed timeline curves. And now that's a one line calculation. I hate a dirty blackboard, so probably you don't see most of the things that I'm seeing here, and that's good, but still I, I don't like seeing them. So, uh, good, so proof of the proposition now. Right, so, so the proof of the lemma was done here, and now the proof of the proposition. Uh, let's calculate, so f is our time function. Uh, so we calculate, uh, and gamma is a future directed causal curve. So let's calculate D, uh, so, we, so we calculate F composed with gamma, right? So we have a this causal curve and a function on your space time. So we calculate how this uh, function changes. Then this is by the chain rule df over dx mu uh, d gamma mu over ds. By the definition of the gradient, this is the same as the scalar product of the gradient of f with gamma dot. So this is the definition of the gradient. And now this one is a uh, time-like uh, past. And this one is causal and future. So by the lemma, this is positive. Good. So something completely trivial. Uh, yeah, just uh, two equalities uh, to prove this, and uh, a useful fact to prove things as far as causality is concerned. Good. So now uh, this was some kind of preparation for the real thing, which is understanding what happens in this Schwarzschild metric at r equal to m, right? So we know everything. Well, we know already that r equals 0 is a problem. Uh, we've discussed this last time. Uh, the geometry is singular there in a sense of infinite tidal forces as you approach r equals 0.
there is a trivial singularity uh, related to angles in this uh, uh, in this part of the metric, which we know doesn't matter. But the question is what happens at r equal to m, right? So now the question we want to uh, address is uh, what a, what happens at r equal to m? What ways? R equal to M. And this is our next uh, section. Eva, please, which number? I think it should be uh, 4.5. Five already? Wow. Okay, good. <laughs> I thought it was three. So four I remembered. Good. And this is the Eddington Finkelstein extensions. Well, that's plural because there'll be actually two. And this has to do, maybe this question, I should have cut and pasted it here rather than there, but that's the point of the section. And uh, uh, the idea is extend uh, the region R larger to M uh, by using uh, uh, to, uh, to uh, well, actually the manifold, because we were just working so far on the manifold, so the manifold, um, let me to remove this better, the manifold. Well, and if I want to do it properly, then I should say, what is the manifold? Well, R was larger than 2M, but of course, then T was R. And we had a S2, right? 2 uh, R by, with R larger than 0 times S2. And this is really an extension, right? So this. In the physics literature, it just uh, often said, well, you introduce a new coordinate system. But it's not really introducing a new, new coordinate system. You are extending your manifold, right? So you're extending the manifold to a new one by introducing uh, new coordinates, right? By introducing new coordinates. But you're really introducing new coordinates in this original manifold, and then you're getting something which you can extend, and you get a metric which is uh, well-behaved even at r equal to m. Good, and so that's the calculation. It goes as follows. Uh, we replace t by a function v, which is t plus f of r. And uh, we're going to choose r, choose f. Well, if you can, so that the metric extends. So you're going to tell me this guy is an idiot. I mean, this is an idea, and this is an idea. What's the difference, right? But I mean, here, it's really an extension of the manifold. Here, we're just playing with coordinates, right? So these are kind of, this is a sub-idea of this one, but this is the big idea. Good. So, so let's, let's uh, do this. So uh, this is probably equation 4 or 5 today or something like that. Let me call it 5. I'm not sure if there was a 4, but was there a 4? No, no four. Well, uh, we can make a four. <laughs> Just and now, now we have a four. Okay, so uh, 
uh, good. So we just calculate, right? So V is T uh, plus F of R. So uh, T is uh, V minus uh, F of R. Uh, and therefore, dt is uh, dv minus f prime dr. And we put it in our metric and we calculate. So now g is minus v dt square. And so we use 2. Uh, and dt is dr uh, dv. So I should write it a little nicer. Probably shouldn't use V and R in the same blackboard because they just look too, too similar. How do I write an R which doesn't look like a V? Um, the problem is that I could use a different symbol except that everyone in the literature uses this one. These are standard notations. So you, you, at this point, you can't use a different notation. Right? So, so let's hope that you, you can... Um, understand what I'm doing. So this is an R square. And well, this one was here already. So the R square over V. Uh, well, the, this part doesn't matter because this part doesn't worry, uh, doesn't have a problem at r equal to m. So, so it is here, but uh, the important part of this calculation is this two-dimensional calculation here. So uh, let's see, right? So we do the squares, and so this is minus v dv square plus 2 v f prime dv d r. And uh, the square term here comes with a minus. This one squares to a plus. And so the R squares would have two terms, uh, minus F minus V F prime square, right? So minus V F prime square plus one over V, the R square. And we don't care about the angles. And so now we choose f so that this is 0. Right? If I do this, then, uh, well, there are no inverse powers of uh, v here. Well, here we're not sure because it depends upon f prime. But at least the inverse power of v will vanish here. Now, what's the equation uh, here? Then this is obvious, right? This should be 0. So f prime square is uh, 1 over v square, because there's 1 v here and 1 v here, uh, which is the same as f prime is equal plus minus 1 over v. Now, if, if f prime is 1 plus minus 1 over v, this term is well behaved as well, right? Because uh, uh, here we're going to get uh, plus minus uh, 2, right? Plus minus 2. So with this choice, this is gone. This is, uh, well, it has a 0, but uh, certainly doesn't blow up. And this is actually a 2, which is great, right? So let's choose, choose uh, uh, the plus sign, and we'll... Uh, 
if you think about this extension z with an s at the end, then the extensions means that you can actually choose the plus and minus sign. And we're going to get two different extensions. Uh, so the first one, we just choose the uh, uh, plus sign. So, so let's just solve this equation. F prime is uh, 1 over v, 1 over 2m over this r, right? So this is uh, our v. I want to integrate this equation. So this is uh, df over dr. How do I integrate this? Someone fast with integrations? Well, this is a rational function, right? So this is a rational function, so uh, <laughs> I should be able to integrate a rational function. Uh, let's see. So let's rewrite this a little bit. I multiply it by r on the top and on the bottom. So I get r top and r minus 2m here. What do we do next if we want to integrate this? Someone has a... Suggestion? So try to integrate this while I'm erasing. There are probably formulas that one could remember how, what the result is. So, What's the result? Nobody has any result? So I have r plus 2m over minus 10 plus quantities. OK, so you're saying that this is r plus, OK? Uh, 2m times the logarithm of r minus 2m possibly in absolute value of this. Plus, and so plus. plus Plus a constant. Okay, good. So, uh, how did you integrate this? Just uh, brute force? Um, just or? writing a fraction as 1r minus 2m plus 2m, 1 goes to a 1 and the rest goes to Okay, so that's exactly what I was going to do. So this one is, this gives me a 1, right? Which produces this r when integrated. And whatever remains is, so this is 1 plus 2m over r minus 2m. So now it's easy to integrate. So f is this. I could stop here. Uh, there's something which is funny here. If you think about uh, r being distance, so what's the log of one centimeter? Yeah, just take a table of logarithms you won't find log of one centimeter. So and somehow, so of course your, 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 your formula is perfectly nice. Uh, it's a little, one can do a little better just by choosing this constant, so this is unitless, right? Because log of a sum, uh, uh, we can just factor out the constant, doesn't matter. The log of a sum is a log of a product, and so what would be a natural constant to choose here? Uh, so that we don't get any units out there, right? So if we absorb this in here and we want to get un rid of the units, then maybe, uh, let me write the, the answer, plus uh, 2m log r 
over 2m minus 1. Like that. And so now, uh, uh, this is unitless now, so uh, a little better. Of course, if mass is uh, used with the same units as, uh, as, uh, as distance, <laughs> so uh, which of course it does, because if I wrote this here, then the mass and distance are the same units. Uh, actually, the, the, the formula would be uh, 1 minus 2m, well, if I remember it correctly, something like c squared. Oh, I never know whether that's c squared or c4 here, but I think it's c squared. So, so, so here uh, we have g is equal 1 and uh, c is equal 1, right? So you choose units so that g and c are 1. Whether this is c4 or, or c2 doesn't matter. I think it's c4. Uh, maybe somebody can check in uh, using uh, any source of knowledge, like my book or something like that, or, or Wikipedia, whether it's c2 or c4. And please confirm that I have the right power here so that I'm not embarrassed in front of the whole world for eternity having the wrong power here on YouTube. Bitte Hilfe! <laughs> so while somebody is trying to help me, uh, yeah, so, so you can choose, choose C so that, uh, so that you can choose C, right? Choose C. Uh, so that you get this formula. And this uh, is often written as R star, and this is called tortoise coordinate. It's a square, thanks a lot, good. So I'm not, I manage not to be embarrassed, at least at this place today. This is called a tortoise coordinate because uh, 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 if you, uh, yeah, so what's happening, right? So if, if, when R goes to 2M, well, this goes to 2M, there's no much to say, but uh, then uh, R over 2M goes to 1, so uh, the argument of log goes to 0, and log of 0 goes to infinity. So this function goes to minus infinity when you're approaching the horizon, right? So you already see that this is something fishy because uh, you're doing a coordinate transformation uh, which is not well behaved when R crosses to M. Uh, so, uh, and you think, well, this is nonsense. I mean, differential geometry tells me that I can use diffeomorphism to change coordinates, but this is not a... This is a terrible at r equal to m, but uh, uh, and that's why what we're doing is not a change of coordinates, but an extension, right? So we're going to take our metric, we're rewriting these coordinates. So now g is equal minus one minus two m over r d v square plus with our change of uh, sign plus we get two. Uh, dvdr. <laughs> Who knows which one is v and which one is is r? Terrible, terrible. The r and plus r square, the omega square, right? So this is a. Uh, the Schwarzschild metric uh, in advanced, uh, in retarded advanced advances. These are called advanced Eddington Finkelstein coordinates. Uh, and now, so nothing wrong at r equal to m. Well, one still has to worry about this. Uh, is this a Lorentzian metric, right? Is this a Lorentzian metric? on the set r louder than zero, and I'm not writing the other ones, right? So there's r in t and the sphere, right? And uh, so, uh, so let's check, right? So uh, let's calculate its, uh, its determinant, right? That g. Now g as a matrix is uh, minus v here. This is our function v. Uh, we have, uh, uh, so in this new coordinates, right, so this is in the uh, vr k 
theta phi coordinates so uh, now the metric is not diagonal anymore right so it's a little more complicated so there is a twice dvdr and remember that we this means that we need to make ones of the diagonal right because this is dvdr this is dr dv and when added they give uh, to dvdr then this is zero So now that's G. Anybody good in calculating the terminants here? Well, uh, this is a block diagonal matrix, right? So this determinant is easy. Uh, and, and, and this one is easy too, right? It's a two by two. So uh, my... Uh, High school memory is that I have to multiply these two, but this gives zero and remove the product of these. So it's minus R4 sine square theta. Okay, so this is our determinant. Uh, and uh, so now there's nothing wrong with R equal to M, right? So it's, uh, of course, it vanishes. Uh, well, uh, it has a problem. Uh, at r equals zero, but this we've already eliminated. It has a problem when sine theta equals zero, but we know this is just silly uh, polar coordinates, uh, spherical coordinates, so this is not an issue. We know how to fix it. So in other words, this is well behaved everywhere. Uh, so what can the signature be? The, the signature certainly is plus plus from this term, right, because these are positive definite. And uh, since the determinant is negative, then one of these directions must be minus the other plus. So the signature is certainly minus plus 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 everywhere. So it's certainly Lorentzian, right? So we have two pluses from this. This is negative, so one has to be minus, one has to be plus. So the signature is uh, minus plus 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 everywhere. on uh, r equals zero, well, if we ignore the, the, the north and south pole, which are not an issue, okay? So we have now a nice, well-behaved, well-behaved Lorentzian metric on this region, right? And this is called uh, the Eddington-Finkelstein extension uh, uh, of the Schwarzschild metric across r larger than 2m. And, uh, and now my point uh, will be uh, that the region under the horizon is actually under the horizon. So there is an event horizon, that there is a region which cannot communicate with the outside world. Uh, and uh, let's try to prove this. Uh, but before we prove this, maybe a comment about uh, this choice here. Right? We, we chose F. Uh, so that, what is this nonsense here? Yeah, so this is positive, but we had to make an, another choice, so this one, right? So this choice, we choose a plus sign, and uh, it, had we chosen a minus sign here, right, if we just go here and choose minus at this place, then we're going to get minus at this place, and uh, Therefore, uh, we'll get a minus here, right? Therefore, we'll get a minus here. But it will not change the determinant because twice minus this stays a plus here. So the signature remains the same and we get a second extension it's a second extension yep 
if we just choose, say, the other sign, so let me just write this u is equal t minus f of r, right? So we just, in other words, f, we still keep the, uh, the same function as before, uh, but then uh, call this u, and then you get a u here, right? u and u, which is better because it's more different from r than before. Good. So, so there are two extensions. So there is a v extension and a u extension. Now, black hole, and that's the most interesting part of this lecture, I hope. Let's see, what do we uh, want to erase? Well, let me just still leave the metric here. Well, actually, I will need uh, this form of the metric. Probably will not need this one anymore, so let me just... Uh, so, the key theorem of this section is the following theorem. The region uh, R smaller than 2M in the uh, manifold. So, we take the V extension, so V R theta, well, uh, theta phi so V is in R, R is uh, louder than zero and uh, theta phi is in this too is a black hole region in the sense that no future directed causal curve can exit this region. Okay, so this is what is a black hole in this sense. So we have a space-time and there are two parts of this space-time. They're separated by a surface R equal to M, uh, which is the event horizon, right? So node R equal to M is called a black hole event horizon. So that's separated by uh, event horizon. Uh, so uh, I like to think of this. Uh, as follows, so you have this manifold here, and uh, this is r equal to m, and uh, if you are here, you cannot exit this region. You can always stay in this region uh, if you are, if you continue on a future directed causal curve, right? So we are observers, 
physics tells us we have to follow future directed causal curves. In fact, time-like because we are massive. If we were photons, then we could, we have this luxury to move on null curves. So here, but we have to move on time-like curves and time-like curves cannot exit this region, right? So uh, there's no, no way, right? This is not allowed. There are no time-like curves which cross this horizon. This is the picture. Good. So let's see. So how do we uh, prove this? Uh, so uh, we already know know that uh, either R or minus R are time functions. On the region R smaller than 2M. Right? So this is the calculation we've already done. So uh, in other words, so this implies, so uh, if gamma is a causal future directed, then R dot uh, cannot change sign, right? So R dot has a sign, so R can only decrease along gamma or R, the R can only increase right so there's only two possibilities uh, this R is a time function. If I have a time-like curve, future directed R either decreases or increases. Uh, so if it can only, in the first case, if R can only decrease, then you cannot get out from this region, right? Because if you are here and R can only decrease, then you're never going to get back to R equal to M. So this is the case uh, I claim is correct in this case. Uh, but I need to exclude the possibility that R can only increase along gamma. Right? So if we had, were in the situation where R can only increase, then in fact, I will always be getting out in the, of, of uh, along time like curves, right? So, well, I could actually either stay, but I could get out because I would get R increasing and I will then increase until r is equal to m, and uh, then I'll, I'll be in the exterior region, right? So, uh, so th then this is, of course, uh, in the region uh, uh, right. So this region r smaller than 2m, let me call this black hole region. So, uh, uh, so this is, uh, call this bh. Right, so then in the black hole region, R can only decrease or increase. Good, so the only thing I have to decide now is the sign of the, uh, if whether the gradient of R is future pointing or past pointing. And how can I do this? Well, uh, I know which curves are future and which curves are past in the exterior region. So I know what is the orientation of light cones in the exterior region. Um, so it suffices to take one causal curve uh, which 
if I can show that there is a causal curve which starts in the exterior region, crosses the horizon, enters here, then uh, causal future directed, then I will know that the future, which, which, which curves are future directed, right? Because if I have a future directed here, uh, the notion of future directed is continuous. So if I know which cones are future pointing here, I will just by continuity know which ones are future pointing here. So showing a single curve which enters from here to there will tell me that there are causal curves which enter from here to there, and they're future directed, and therefore, in, uh, at least in some region here, R dot will be increasing along those, but then the sign is the same on all curves. So the argument So we need to exclude B, right? So we have to exclude, so in case A, in case A, uh, well, the result, uh, uh, so uh, the theorem is true by the proposition. So the, the theorem follows from the proposition. follows, this is R, right? This is R. Follows from the proposition. So we have to exclude B. And so uh, this is done by showing that something funny happened here. Uh, Uh, so the computer made some strange sounds. Is there a question or something like that? No? This is done. Yes? No? Okay. By showing that there exists uh, at least one, right? So there, there exists uh, at least one future directed uh, well, causal curve, one a future directed causal curve uh, that enters the black hole region. Good. So we're going to do this right, now, uh, right away. So again, the idea is the following. We have this region with a time function, which is either r or minus r. If the function is minus r, uh, this means that well, a time function has, can only increase, right? So if the, uh, along future directed causal curves. So if the time function is R, you can only get out from this region because if you started with a value of R smaller than 2M, it can only increase, so you cannot go to, towards zero, but you can go towards R equal to M. If the time function is minus R, uh, it can only increase. So if you started with R is, uh, well, M, 
minus r increasing means that you're going to that it's that r is going to be smaller and smaller, right? Uh, minus r increasing means r decreasing. So if you started with r equal m, r can only decrease. So you can never reach r equal to m. Okay? So that's the that's the philosophy here. And so that the only thing to make sure is that which one, which case are we in? And we know where the time orientation is here. So if we know a, we have a causal curve which starts here and enters this region, if it's future directed here, it's future directed everywhere because along a causal curve, uh, time orientation is constant, right? The gamma dot. Uh, the time orientation of the tangent is constant because the, to change time orientation, you would have to go to zero, right? through zero. But the, the light cone has two components. Uh, if you want to go from one to another, you would go ha have to th through zero. Uh, so if you're not, then it means that you're always either future or past directed. So you find one curve on which, which enters. I will know that R must be decreasing along such curves, and therefore minus r is a time function. Good. And uh, so the, the curve is going to be uh, very simple. By the way, uh, in the le I was a, I, I th I've always thought that this is the simplest proof uh, uh, that this is a black hole region, and I thought it's very simple. Uh, However, uh, in the notes, I'm giving, it's in, my, in, this, uh, in, in the book, uh, uh, I, I'm giving a different proof of this fact, which is, in my opinion, more complicated. And I was very astonished that some students, when they came to the exam, uh, were giving me the second complicated proof because they thought it was simpler. So uh, if you don't like this proof, you can look up the other one, decide which one is simpler, which one you understand better. Good. So we take this curve S, uh, which goes, so we take S in, uh, uh, let's see, where are we going to take it? We're going to take R equal minus S, so T, T, so V is constant. So this is our curve gamma. Uh, so V is constant, uh, R is minus S, and uh, the angles are constant, right? So, uh, so this is our curve, so this is R, R equal minus S. And so S is in which uh, range? Then we should take R uh, in, uh, we start with uh, minus infinity, right? So minus infinity. Uh, zero. Okay. So we have a negative parameter, and we look at we take a curve uh, in which v is constant, r varies, theta is constant, phi is constant. So, well, you look at this, and you say, how the, could this possibly be a causal curve? I mean, you're just varying the radius. Uh, and other coordinates are fixed, right? So you have to be very careful with uh, uh, coordinates in general relativity. Uh, the radius is, uh, in this case, a funny function, right? Uh, in Euclidean geometry, varying the radius, other coordinates fixed would be certainly a space-like curve, right? But this one is time-like. Actually, it's no. Uh, it's not time-like. It's, uh, uh, it's no. It, but it's a causal curve. Uh, so we'll have a causal curve, which is future directed entering the black hole, which will be, um, uh, which will be the example we need. So claim, so gamma is null, even though uh, it looks funny. So let's see, how do we do this? Well, we calculate gamma dot, right? Gamma dot is zero dv plus, uh, dr over ds uh, dr plus 0 d theta plus 0 d phi. And this is minus 1, right? So this is minus dr period. So the length of the tangent of 
is, uh, well, is uh, twice, is just g of dr dr because the minus uh, squares to one is drr. So now we need to remember the metric in the uh, v, uh, uh, vr theta phi coordinates. So I, you can try to look it up while I'm erasing here. So uh, I'm going to write it down again. So G was uh, in this coordinate system is minus V uh, dv square plus, uh, was it plus or was it minus? I think it's two, right? It's plus, right? Can you please uh, confirm that this is a plus? Not that this matters. It, it's a plus? Yeah. Thanks a lot. Plus R square D omega square. So GRR is uh, zero, right? There's no DR square terms here. There is a, a GVV term, there is a GVR, but the GRR is zero. So this is zero, right? So, so gamma is uh, causal because it's a null curve. Now, is it uh, future directed? So in the a uh, region uh, r larger than 2m. Uh, let's see, uh, we can calculate d uh, t composed with gamma of s over ds. Uh, well, let's calculate this. I claim that this is uh, positive. Uh, so anticipating, right? So we're going to show that this is positive. Therefore, T in the region outside of the black hole is increasing. Uh, therefore, T is a time function. Uh, then, therefore, well, but T in the outside world was a time function. So gamma is future directed, right? Because it's a causal. Uh, time functions can only increase or decrease. And future directed means increasing. So here I'm going to show that this is increasing. So this is future directed. So this will be a causal future directed curve entering the black hole region. So you can enter, but you cannot exit. Good. So let's see. So T, uh, so we had the formula that V is T minus uh, uh, T plus F. Uh, so T is V minus F. So this is d uh, over ds v minus f of r. This is r. Uh, we look at our curve on gamma. Uh, d v over ds is zero minus f prime dr over ds. dr over ds is minus 1 on this curve. So this is f prime. But we know what f prime was. Well, f prime by definition was 1 over v. Right? And this is positive in, uh, in the outside world. OK, so this is the end of the argument. So gamma is future directed in the exterior region and therefore everywhere.
So this looks like a very good place to stop. And that's the end of the proof throughout. Good. So we now know that um, the Eddington Finkelstein extension of the exterior part of the Schwarzschild solution is a black hole in the sense that you can cross the region, the event horizon r equal to m from outside towards the inside, but you cannot cross it back. Once you've entered, you stay there. Uh, once you've entered, you have no choice but to head towards r equals zero, so towards the singularity, so where you're going to be squeezed and crunched in various directions. You don't want to do this. So please uh, don't go inside a black hole, at least uh, until the next lecture. Questions? No questions? Then I'll see you uh, on Thursday. Bye, everyone. Recording stopped.